So welcome to my brew day. Um, just going to run you through some of my equipment, uh, just the sort of things I use, stuff I've gathered over the years of doing this, things I've found to be good and not so good, and hopefully give you a few tips and pointers on the way. So the first thing I do is uh, um, I write all my notes down, and as you can see, I've got everything written down. I use a software um, brewer's friend just to work out the numbers. Uh, to get the right amount of hops and um, how much uh, malt to put in there. Um, this one's going to be an American Pale uh, using Citra and Amarillo. I get my Citra and Amarillo from uh, the malt miller. Um, these hops here, I've got some Fuggle, which is homegrown. Uh, this stuff here is actually, um, if we look outside now, we can see it's actually just about coming into ready for harvesting about the next month or so, so they'll be growing for this year. Um, I'm currently using last year's stuff. So uh, what do I use? Well, I use a lot of homemade stuff. So the, you can see this is my HLT or hot liquor tank. It's an old fermenter. It's got um, the good old five pound value Tesco kettle elements. Um, just a 40 mil hole drilled through the side of it and those put in there. I did build myself a uh, controller um, this is very simple, it's just a plastic box with, um, it's got two switches here, ignore these, it, this is just an internal fan just dissipating the heat, and inside there I've got two uh, variable uh, voltage regulators, and I can just v vary how much voltage goes through to the elements uh, and control the boil. We don't actually need this, but I like this when I'm trying to get a nice rolling boil, which we'll see later. Something else I don't need um, is... Uh, the mill so I'll be milling my grain because um, I buy my grain uncrushed um, you can buy it crushed obviously yeah, again this is from the malt miller uh, I'm going to be using some Maris Otter a bit of crystal and some torrified wheat uh, what else I've got scales obviously uh, this is my mash tun um, I've currently got um, some water in it I've got two kettlefuls of water boiling water in there um, I like to preheat the mash tun um, just because um, when you uh, put your strike water in there you don't want it to lose any heat um, this is actually just an old um, ice box cooler uh, the sort of thing you take on a picnic um, I've took the, in the guts of it inside out and put some more insulation inside there I've wrapped it in this sort of bubble wrap kind of stuff um, in the lid because this was just hollow I put some Celotex roofing insulation in there and I've put myself a thermometer it's just a long thermometer that sits in there and you can see it's currently about I don't know, 70 odd degrees and I'll fit the tap to it so I can get the the wort out so we can look at that later this is probably my proudest moment this is my boiler um, that I built um, so I made um, just got a, um, one of these mega pots online this was half price it was 40 quid they're normally 80 quid I got it in a Black Friday sale a couple of years ago um, off a of brew builder I got um, just a thermometer in there. Don't really need that on your boiler because obviously when it's boiling, it's boiling, but it gives you an idea of when it's getting close to the boil so you don't have to stand there constantly watch it. I've got, um, again, a tap on there. This is just a regular um, tap, nothing special. And I've put two, I went actually and bought two decent um, elements to put in there. Um, again, just the kettle lead type ones, they go in. And it all works rather nicely i think that's pretty much all my gear uh fermenters i just use plastic buckets like you get from wilco's or anywhere else like that so let's get started so the first thing to do is to get the strike water going um i installed a tap in my laundry room um i fill this up i'm going to have this up to about 20 liters you'll notice i put my own graduations on there the ones that are printed aren't very accurate as you can see as they compare to my ones. Um, I'm going to get this up. Uh, my strike water for my equipment uh, will be 77 degrees uh, and the strike water is what you put into the mash tun. Um, it will be different for everybody's equipment depending on what you're using. Um, I'll also put um, half a Camden tablet in there. Let's get this going. Turn this on. And then then we've got some water in it. Like I say, that fan's just to dissipate any heat. So we'll get the strike water on first and then I'll start uh, milling some grain. 
So here's my half a Camden tablet, just crushed between two teaspoons. And we're gonna literally just chuck that in. Give it a little stir. Just make sure it dissipates through. And then as you can see, I've got myself a little set up here. I've got a hop spider, which I don't use anymore. Um, we'll look at the way I did my hops later in the boil. And from there, I've just dangled a uh, thermometer. And you can see it's warming up, 34 degrees. Um, got both these on flat out just to get that up to temperature. Like I said, when it gets up to 77, I can adjust these just to hold it at 77 so I'm ready to actually um, go in. So just weighing out my grain now. So there's a kilo there of marisotta. So I just use a bit of Tupperware. So I need, this is torrified wheat going in, so I'm just going to need 250 of that. And my recipe, this is my own recipe. I started following recipes in books um, and then getting the hang of it myself. Um, and if you use uh, the software like Brewers Friends, you can work out how much sugar you want in there and it's quite interesting to sort of yourself. This is a bit of crystal going in. So again all the recipes I use are based around existing recipes, most of them are these days. Um, so 250 in there, 249 is close enough for me. That's my crystal. That goes in there as well. If you're interested in any good books, um, Palmer's How to Brew, that's quite good. And obviously this one here, the Greg Hughes Homebrew Beer, They're, those are, are two good buys. So this is the grain mill, um, it's a two roller one, uh, it was about 130 quid for, again for malt miller, I get most of my stuff from there. Um, just attach an electric drill, I've got a cordless one, turns it quite nice on the low setting, you don't want to go in too fast, and away you go. And again it's just going to drop into an old fermenter. So this grain bill is around about 5 kilos um, and as you can see it really doesn't take long to move through it at all. That was about 1.5 kilos in, there, in that hopper at the time. The hopper holds around about 3 to go right to the very top. So that intake, that's about one and a half kilos. So that's now got three kilos of uh, marisotta in the top, so you can see it's fairly much uh, to the top. So you can get about three kilos in there at a time. Um, why do I mill it myself? Because I can. Um, does it give? Is it any better than buying pre-crushed? I don't know. I'm not an expert in it. Um, I would say that my efficiency has probably gone up. Um, not a massive amount, but a little bit. But I just like doing it, so uh, here we go again. So you can see, because I've got the lid on it, there's no dust. Everyone moans about the million million grain amount of dust it creates. Get no dust whatsoever, and it really doesn't take long. It's so much of a fast. So that's it all crushed now, so there's about five kilos in there. Um, I'd like quite a fine crush, so I get quite a little bit of flour in it as well. Um, doesn't I don't get a stuck mash, we'll see how I do that in a minute. Um, I think that's where I get my slightly better efficiency from, because it's a slightly finer crush than what you'll get if you're buying it pre-crushed. So my strike water's at about 77.1, 77.2, something like that. So, uh, I'm now going to what we call dough in. Um, doughing in is basically adding the mash uh, water and the grain together. Now this is just a, as you can see, it's just a cool box with a tap on it. Make sure the tap's closed. I've done that before, filling it up. I think every brewer has. Now I actually use, you can see there's nothing inside. Um, some people have some copper pipe with holes in it um, to, to stop the grain from running out when we're um, getting the, the, the wort out of it. I like to use a brew in the bag bag. 
Um, so you can get these, uh, this one came from eBay I think, it was about six quid. Um, I wash it out every time. It's lasted about oh, 30 odd brews, I think I've done this with this one. So I like to peg mine in just to stop it from slipping when I'm um, actually doughing in. So I get these pegs, I got these from Tesco's I think. Special offer, £2.50 uh, a few years back. Uh, and then I'm going to put into here 14 litres of water at 77.1 degrees. Um, and then I'm going to dough in approximately 5 kilos of uh, grain um, and then leave it and see where we get to. So I've now got about 14 litres of water in there. I'm now going to put in the, uh, all the grain and you want to keep it mixing whilst you're doing it uh, and letting it go in fairly slowly, probably a bit slow. Uh, my glasses are steaming up. Um, so the reason you don't want to just dump it straight in there because you get what's called dough balls where all the grain sticks together and then your efficiency won't be quite so good because it's not exposed to as much of the water so you basically want to get it in there with no clumps of all the grain sticking together so let's hurry this up a little bit otherwise it gets a bit boring to look at As one of the pigs. So we can see now it's starting to thicken up quite a lot. I just need to slow up the grain a little bit just to break up some of these clumps or dough balls as they're called. see now why I have the pegs on there because otherwise the bag ends up at the bottom and the reason for the bag is to get the wort out and leave all the grain behind also makes clearing up a damn sight easier once we're done let's get all that in there hold that for a sec so I want to make sure that all the grain is wet and mixed in again see the dough balls there you want to get rid of those so just by mixing it around gets rid of those breaks them up a bit do that so that's done. I'm now gonna take the clips off they'll get a little rinse put my lid on like so and then watch that go up to hopefully about 66 67 degrees I'm gonna leave that for about an hour um, and then we'll see how much it drops over the hour in the homemade mash tun so we've got it sitting around about 67 degrees, so it's probably one degree more than I'd want it to be, but that should be fine. Um, it's just going to sit there now, so I'll just make a note of the time. Um, I've put some more water into my hot liquor tank, uh, and I'll get that up to around about 77 degrees again, uh, ready for the sparge. I do a dunk sparge, um, which we'll look at uh, in a minute. And for those who are interested, this is how I store my grains. So I keep them in the original bags, but I've got these large, I think they're about 35, 40 litre, um, quite heavy duty plastic pots. Uh, and then that all keeps it all nice and fresh and keeps all the rodents away as well. Okay, so I'm measuring out from the hops now. Uh, I've already done my homegrown fuggle. Um, I use these muslin bags. Um, I use these to start off with. 
Uh, but then, like everything I do, I try and find a better way of doing things. But then came across these things, which always get caught up, um, which are quite good. Uh, they worked all right. Um, you can only get around about 25, 30 grams of hop in there, and it starts to get a bit compact. So I'm not sure if it affects the utilisation, because obviously it's only a certain size. They're the biggest ones I could find. But you basically put your hops in there, close it down, and hang it over the side, or just chuck it in. Um, I did purchase one of these. Um, I believe it's called a Hop Spider. I can't remember now. Um, bought it quite a while ago, but I don't like it because the mesh is way too fine. I don't know how well you can see that on the camera, but um, I don't think I was getting so much hop utilisation because the, the boiling wort wasn't running through it enough. So the hops were in there, but I don't believe that the wort was running through it enough um, to get as much hop utilisation as possible. I don't know, I could be wrong, um, but uh, I didn't really like it, didn't really get on with it, so that just I use that for storing stuff in now. So I'm doing an American Pale Ale, so I've got the Fuggle. This is my bittering hop, so I'm just purely using that for bittering, so that's going to go in at the start of the boil. It'll be a 60 minute boil. Um, that's last year's uh, harvest. I've got some Amarillo and some Citra, so I need at 10 minutes to the end of the boil, so 50 minutes in, I'm going to be putting in, uh, whoops, hang on a second, I haven't zeroed the scales, this helps, so, making a right old mess here, zero the scales, and 30 grams Amarillo is going to go in there. But so I just prefer the muslin bags now. Bang on 30. So all I do is just tie a very basic knot in the top. And that just gets thrown in. So that would get thrown in with 10 minutes to go. Um, and then using that for flavouring. There's there'd be a little bit of bittering from it in the last 10 minutes. So I'm going to have 20 minutes as a bittering hop. I've then got 30 grams of Amarillo and 30 grams of Citra as well that will go in with 10 minutes to go. And then at flame out, so when I turn off the heat um, and let it cool down to about 80 degrees, I'll then uh, put in um, another 20 of Amarillo, because that's all I've got left, and 30 of Citra. And again, that's purely for flavouring, and they just get thrown into the boiler when it's done. Um, so I'll continue making a mess here, uh, loading up these muslin bags, and then we'll see where we are. So we've been mashing for one hour, uh, and the temperature's not really dropped, maybe half a degree if that. Um, so I'm quite happy with the old mash tun, it's done well, as always. So it's been there an hour. Some people like to uh, stir it halfway through. I don't, just something I don't do. Not saying it's right or wrong, but uh, it's just something I don't do. So we're going to get these pegs back on because again, I don't want to lose the bag into the. And what I'm going to do is drain off. You can see the liquid in there now. Look like that. See that? That's what we want to get out of this mash tun now. So to stop the bag from covering over the tap, I'll just put the spoon in front of it and get the cable out of the way open up this tap again making sure the tap to the boiler is shut and then you can start to see it and this is worked nice and hot obviously So what I'm doing now is just making sure that the bag doesn't sit in front of the tap and block it. I want to get as much of this work out of here as possible. And then once I've got all the work out, I shall do what's known as a batch sparge or dunk sparge. Basically I'm just going to fill it up again with some more hot water so I've emptied out the uh, words that was in there you can see the grains all shrunk down um, 
weren't sitting in the boiler. So I've closed the tap off on here. I've now got strike water again, sit or sparge water sitting at 77 degrees. And I'm just gonna fill it up again. Now some people get all funny about this and they don't agree with this method. They, they like to uh, do what's called fly sparging, which is allowing the, the grain bed to filter by trickling water through it. Um, I don't have any problem with this. Uh, I get decent quality beers, nice and clear, good flavorings. Um, so I'm quite happy just to fill it up again. Oh, lost my spoon. Uh, and I'll just let it sit for about 10 minutes or so. I'll give it a good stir just to mix it all through. I'll leave it sitting just for about 10 minutes or so. Um, and then I'll empty that out in the same way as I've just done. Uh, which again, I'll, I'll show you that. It's quite straightforward, it's much the same as what I've just done. And then I'll repeat that one more time. And then generally that's enough to fill up my boiler and give me enough for my boil volume. Um, I won't bother putting the lid on that. I'll just leave that as it is just to sit there just for a few minutes um, just to rinse some grains through and empty that out. Okay, so uh, that's just been sat for around about 10 minutes or so. Just sitting there, I did stir it a little bit halfway through. And again, you can see we've got kind of words again. So I'm going to empty that lot into the boiler. Again, just got my spoon down there, just keeping the bag away from the tap, just to make sure it doesn't get clogged. And then once that's emptied out, I'll just fill it up again. So, last sparge. Just going to fill this up. One more time. Making sure the tap's off. Just to give it one last rinse through. You can see the boiler's probably about two thirds full. And what I'm going to try and do is get that boiler filled to within about an inch and a half of the top. then get ready for the boil itself. So this one I'll probably only leave in here for about five minutes or so once it's filled up to the top. I'll leave it for about five minutes um, just to wash the grains through again. So that's the sparge complete. Uh, now I've got it all into the boiler. I'm probably a little bit higher than I want to be there. Um, not quite so much in there maybe i have to see how we go with the uh with the boil when it's when it gets going we will lose quite a lot in the boil off um which is why i made uh one of these it's an inline ducting fan it's about eight inches or so um let's turn it on uh, and that'll suck out a lot of the moisture stops it getting too damp in my laundry room um especially on a day like today where it's raining so that's the mash time finished with now, so all I need to do now is uh, pull the bag out. Uh, I'll then empty the bag of spent grains into my composter uh, and just wash out the mash tun and that's all done. So what we're doing now is waiting for the, the boiler to do its thing and get itself up to a nice rolling boil. So it's going to take probably around about 15 minutes, I would have thought, 10-15 minutes to get up to a, a rolling boil. Then we can have a look at the boil. Uh, look at the hot break um, and see where we go from there. So we're nearly at boiling, you can see the hot break is just going to start coming over the top in a minute so I'm just going to have to carefully watch this before it overflows. Um, hot break I don't bother skimming off, some people do. Um, I just dispense it back into the, stir it back in, uh, but I better catch that before it goes. So I managed to catch that before it uh, boiled over, all I did was turn the heat down a little bit 
Uh, now increasing it ever so slightly again, uh, and you can see how much it's risen. Um, I stir my hot brake, this is the hot brake on the top here, all this foamy stuff. Um, I just stir it back in. Some people don't like it, some people like to scrape it off. I've not found, I used to try and scrape it off, but I've not found it makes any difference at all. So I just uh, let it do its thing. Um, the key with this is patience. Um, getting up to the boil, get a nice rolling boil going. Um, you can just start to see it's just starting to go there. And what will happen is the uh, the hot break, all this foam will actually go back into uh, the solution, uh, which we'll look at in a minute. So we're just starting to come to the rolling boil now. It's just coming up nicely. You can see that hot break has gone back into the solution. So uh, let's take about just over 15 minutes to get to that stage um, from when we turned it all on. So the elements are pretty good. Um, I've got them turned down now so you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see actually, but I've actually got them turned down a bit. Uh, I've got both of them running. Uh, the good thing about having both running turned down is you don't get any scorching on the elements themselves. In the old setup with the plastic uh, boiler with two kettle uh, elements, because they're either on or off, I didn't have this controller. Um, I used to get up to boil with two and then turn one off and leave one on rolling and that would give a nice rolling boil uh, but it used to scorch the element because it was obviously uh, going flat out. So uh, we've got 20 grams of fuggle that's going to go in, that's the homegrown fuggle going in. So again that just gets pushed under, um, make a note of the time and in 45 minutes time I shall be adding some Irish moss which I'll explain later and the chiller which I'll explain later and then at 50 minutes time there'll be more hops going in um, and you can see that hop breaks pretty much gone back into the, the solution now so we'll see you uh, at the next stage in about 45 minutes time. So we're about 45 minutes into the boil now and you can see just how much it's reduced in volume. It's gone down probably about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half already. Um, we'll lose a little bit more, uh, it's known as boil off. So with 15 minutes to go I've got uh, some Irish moss which is like a red seaweed. Um, this is known as a, a kettle fining uh, and it's to help produce clearer beer. Uh, so you chuck that in just straight like that. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is my homemade uh, chiller. I'm going to put this in for the last 15 minutes. Uh, all this is is some 10 mil copper tubing uh, and I'll round it round. I can't remember where now, it must have been a paint pot or a tube of some sort. Uh, and just bent it around that just bit by bit. Um, and then on the ends I've put some hose fittings uh, and I then connect it to my tap which then connects to this, which then goes around uh, into my sink. Uh, so this is just going to go in for the last 15 minutes or thereabouts. So I'll just chuck that in. It does stop the ball, but the ball will get going again in a minute. Um, and in five minutes time I'll be putting in the last of the boil hops before I put in the, 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 the remaining hops for flame out. So you can see the rolling boils back on again. Uh, we've now got about 10 minutes of the boil left to go. Uh, the Irish moss went in, it was about 4 or 5 grams of that I think I put in there. Uh, with 15 minutes to go, the chiller's gone in. The reason we put the chiller in early is to sanitise it. So it has a good old boil for about 15 minutes or so. Um, although it's clean when it goes in, we want to make sure it's nice and sanitised. So we've got, uh, with 10 minutes to go, we've got I think I did 30 of Citra and 30 of Amarillo, or was it 20 of Amarillo? I can't remember, I think it was 30. Um, I've got it written down on a book. So these will go in now for the last 10 minutes and then we'll uh, turn it all off. So that's an hour into boil now, so we'll turn off the elements completely. Let that sit and what I'll probably do for this one is chuck my uh, flame out hops in now. Some people like to wait until it's down to about 80 degrees. Um, 
Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Today I'm thinking I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to chuck them in now. Uh, give them in there for about well, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. We'll add a little bit to the bittering because it's still quite hot, um, but really not much at all. So I'll probably leave them there for about 10 minutes or so uh, and then start the cooling. And we'll start the cooling just by turning that tap on and then we can watch it come down. So it's had about 10 minutes just sitting. Uh, we've dropped about four degrees, it's now sitting about 96. So what I'm gonna do now is just turn on the uh, tap, uh, that one over there, and that will then send water through the, the coil chiller, um, all the way down into the sink. Uh, and then we'll see how long that takes to chill this down. I wanna get this down to around about 20 degrees or thereabouts. Uh, we'll see how long that takes. So you can see uh, we've dropped nearly 40 degrees, that's only taken five minutes. Uh, the initial temperature drop is very, very quick. It will take a lot longer to get the last uh, 20 or 30 degrees down now. Uh, but now we're below sort of 60 degrees, so I'm gonna take the hops out. Uh, so I've got a big pair of tongs and I'll grab the hops in the bags and get them out. Um, so I'm just left with the words in there. So we're down to just a touch above 20 degrees, which is fine because I'll be using uh, a yeast that's got a range, well it's, this is US 05, it's got a range of uh, 12 to 25, ideally 15 to 22 degrees C. So we're about 21, 22. By the time I get this into the fermenter, uh, it'll come down a little bit more. Um, the fermenter has been cleaned, uh, quite funny about sterilizing and cleaning I am. Uh, I've not lost a brew yet <laughs> uh, in my years of doing this but um, never say never, it's always the first time for everything. Uh, so what do I use? Well I use VWP to clean it um, and that's really just as a cleaner. I then rinse it out a good four or five times to make sure I get rid of all the chlorine um, because it is a chlorine based cleaner and I then sanitize using Star Sand which I put into uh, a spray bottle like this, mix it up, um, brilliant stuff. So long as it's got a pH of lower than three, uh, it's good to use. And I use these universal strips, uh, these pH test strips every time I use it, just to make sure that it is correct. So what I'm gonna do now is get it out of the boiler into the fermenter. And I'm gonna do that just by opening the tap on there and straight in. Now some people uh, they'll do all sorts of things to try and get rid of as much of the brake material that's in uh, the, the kettle in the boiler. Um, I used to hold a sock, a hot sock over the end of this uh, hose to try and catch it all. It would take me forever uh, to try and get it out. Now I just let it all go into the fermenter um, because when I ferment I'll leave it for a couple of weeks and I'll then do what's called cold crashing which is basically uh, dropping the temperature because I've got a brew fridge which you'll see in a minute um, and when it comes out of the fermenter which hopefully you'll see uh, in a, probably in a different video is it's nice and clear um, so I don't really worry about all the brake material going in You'll notice I'm trying to froth it all up. That's a good thing. We're trying to get as much oxygen into the work as possible. Some people will then thrash it with a uh, spoon as well. I find just pouring from a great height is enough just to introduce some oxygen back into it after we've boiled it all out. So I'll do this for a little while until it's uh, all in there. And then we'll put to the yeast. So before I pitch the yeast, the next thing I want to do is draw off a sample um, and this is so I can measure the specific gravity of it. Uh, so all I use is a 100ml syringe like this one um, and then I'm just going to pour it into my uh, one of these, whatever you're going to call that, plastic tube um, with a hydrometer in it and then we'll be able to measure the uh, gravity of it and then we'll be able to check it after fermentation to make sure that uh, fermentation is finished and actually 
happened. So we've taken a gravity reading, it's coming in around about 1056, 1058, something like that, or 1.056. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, that's about six points or eight points above where it should be. Uh, so that's good efficiency from the mash uh, and the boil. So that's quite happy with that. I put that down to where I middle my own grain. Uh, that's the only reason I think I get a slightly higher efficiency. So now we've got the uh, work sitting there. It's time to pitch the yeast. So there's lots of different ways of uh, uh, adding yeast to your um, wort. Uh, I just open the packet and then sprinkle it straight in. Uh, there'll be a lot of people out there saying you should rehydrate it first. Um, I did go through a phase of rehydrating it and found absolutely no difference at all to the, rather than just sticking it on the top. Um, so i am not got into liquid yeasts yet. Whether I will or not, I don't know. Um, liquid yeasts are better because there are far more different strains and uh, it's a little bit more involved than I want to get into. So I'm quite happy pitching dry yeast over the top. Like I say, you can rehydrate it in water. Um, I'd started doing that for a bit and found no difference to it whatsoever, so I just pitch it dry now. So we've pitched the yeast, um, put the lid on it. You'll notice there's no um, airlock or bubbler or anything on top of my lid. Um, I used to have one of those, um, but it never used to bubble because I couldn't get a decent seal around the outside of the rim um, so I don't bother now um, I don't have a hole in the top at all I just crack the lid ever so slightly so it's sealed around the back of it and just the front here ever slightly cracked to allow CO2 to escape um, and I've never had a problem with it since probably because it's in a fridge um, so it's not getting lots of air thrown at it it's sitting in quite a very um, uh, still environment uh, the brew fridge is probably one of the best things uh, I've done to improve my brewing. Um, so I just bought a second-hand bridge off of eBay. Um, it would cost me about 25 quid, I think. Uh, cleaned it up. Uh, it's an under-counter one. If you're going to get one, get one without an ice box. Otherwise, you find, uh, especially if you're going to have an airlock on there at all, uh, you haven't got enough room because of the ice box gets in the way. Um, and I then control the temperature using an Inkbird um, temperature controller, which is one of these. Um, this is the 308 I think it is and you just literally plug your fridge uh, and a heater a heat source of some sort into there set the temperature I've set mine to 19 uh, it's currently 19.3 in there um, you can set uh, the parameters so that um, it, the, the fridge turns on or the heater turns on I think I've got mine at about half a degree or something like that so it's always going to be within uh, half a degree of where I want it to be um, to heat it, you can use all sorts of things. People use light bulbs. And, uh, I use a, a tube heater. You can just about see it in there, I think, just around the back here. So that's what this thing is. Uh, it's just a, a 45 watt tube heater. Um, it's all you need. They're about 15 quid off of Amazon. I think I've got that one. Um, and it works absolutely brilliantly. Uh, so that will now sit in there. All I'll do now is I'll check that probably tomorrow now, more tomorrow morning and just see um, that fermentation is starting to take place. Uh, I'll do that by looking for um, a Krausen on the top here uh, to see if uh, fermentation is taking place. I won't actually crack the lid, I'll just have a look through the plastic itself. Uh, I'll then shut the door and I won't look at that again now for another couple of weeks um, where I'll cold crash it and then get it into uh, one of my kegs, which I'll do separate videos for. So that's my brew day complete. That's taken around about five hours. Uh, I can sometimes do it a little bit quicker than that uh, when I'm not trying to video it and get things ready for it. Um, and it depends on what you're brewing as well. Uh, it's a thoroughly enjoyable day, apart from the clearing up. That obviously uh, isn't so nice. So what we'll do now is we'll leave this one for, uh, like I said, a couple of weeks. I'll then do another video on uh, getting it out of there and into a keg. Um, I don't do bottling, I used to, but I don't anymore. Uh, just because I can't be doing with all the faffing around cleaning and washing bottles up. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, like I say, this is just the way I do it. There's loads of different ways of doing this. I'm sure someone will be along to tell me I'm doing something wrong. Um, that's fine. Um, I, I enjoy the beer that I drink uh, out of the process of doing this. 
Uh, I really enjoy the process of brewing and uh, if this video has helped you um, then that's only good can come out of that. So uh, thanks for watching and uh, see you on the next video hopefully.